so just to give you an idea of where we want to go with this course, and <clears throat> so the goal of the course, and therefore the goal of this week, is to study a theory that can be called, since we called the one we studied yesterday, a scalar electrodynamics, we should call this one a spinner electrodynamics, <clears throat> or what is known in the literature as QED, quantum electrodynamics. <clears throat> <clears throat> and what is this? Well, it's a theory of electrons, positrons, and photons. <clears throat> okay? So that's the goal. <clears throat> so the moment you see that we have succeeded in constructing this theory, then most likely I'll say, well, that's the end of the course. We can go home. Okay? But I'm afraid we're missing a very important part of this. <coughs> we're missing the electrons. And that's what we're going to try to get today. Okay? So yesterday, <coughs> we ended with <coughs> saying that <coughs> there was a homomorphism from SL2C to SO3, 1. And the idea is that if you have a vector, you can construct a matrix by dotting the vector with the Pauli matrices and get something that looks like, say, V0 plus V3, V0 minus V3, V1 minus I, V2, V1 plus I, V2. And therefore, the determinant of this object happened to be V mu, V mu. <coughs> okay. So, If A is a two by two matrix that belongs to SL to C, okay, then we can construct a V prime from V by acting on B with this matrix, okay, in this form. So yesterday, we also said that <coughs> this provides for us, or these two by two matrices, provide what is called a representation of SL2C. Now, SL2C, we can think about SL2C as an abstract object, okay? But for us, for human beings to actually be able to handle it and to see what it is, we have to find representations of that object in terms of things that we can manage, in terms of things that we can use, okay? So we all know very well vector spaces. Right? So those are things that we like. And we know that if we have matrices, we can act on that vector space. So we have a vector space, and we can have linear transformations that we can make on that vector space. So those are the things we learn in algebra, in algebra 101, I guess. Maybe in, even in high school, right? This, this is a, yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. That's the one thing that we learn in high school, yes. Sorry, it's been a long time. <laughs> so I mix already both things. Um, so, <coughs> so for those of you who are not very familiar with, with the word representation, what we mean by that is a map from an abstract object, okay, into the space of linear operators acting on some vector space, okay? Now, the vector space might have some dimension. Maybe infinite dimensional, it might be finite dimensional. If it's finite dimensional, then these operators acting on the vector space are nothing but matrices. Okay? So, 
These two by two matrices with complex entries with determinant equal to one, what are they of SL2C? They are, they provide for us a representation of SL2C, okay? And what's the dimension of that representation? Two, it's a two dimensional representation. Very good. So SL2C now becomes a space, becomes a set of operators acting on a two dimensional vector space, okay? Now, <coughs> let's try to see exactly what it looks like. So the way we study this is by going very infinitesimally close to the identity. It's a group, so there must be something that is the identity. And if that representation is a map where composing operators of this guy will correspond to multiplying matrices, okay? Then the identity operator of this guy better become the identity matrix here. Yes? Is this uh, an irreducible representation? <laughs> this one is a reducible, irreducible representation. Yes, that's right. Irreducible means that we cannot find a similarity transformation so that we can represent our matrix as a block diagonal matrix, right? Because if it becomes, if it becomes block diagonal, meaning that it's a block with zero, zero, well, maybe like this, right? A block, zero, zero, and a block, okay? So each of these blocks would by themselves be representations, okay? And that's what we mean by reducible, because we can split it into pieces. This one hardly can be, right? this one clearly cannot be split into pieces, right? Because <clears throat> yes? Uh, we want to figure out if this representation is acting on the two-dimensional complex vector space, or is acting on the vector space of two-by-two two complex matrices, like in the line above. So as I said before, this guy, this two-by-two-dimensional these two by two matrices are supposed to act on a two dimensional vector space. So we have to give a name to those objects, okay? And we will. But let's, <coughs> let's first study this guy a little bit. So yesterday we said that this two by two dimensional representation has generators. Given by this and this. Now this one, you're familiar with this guy from quantum mechanics. So this gives rise to elements of the form e to the i j dot e, where this is a vector, <coughs> a three-dimensional vector, Okay, there. This is something that you have seen in quantum mechanics, right? But perhaps you haven't seen this one. So in the end, I decided to follow one of the suggestions yesterday and call this beta. Not B, yeah, it's, so, but that's the Greek one for this. <clears throat> And it's the same thing. Sorry. With some unit vector chi. Now, since I'm trusting that you guys have looked at what these guys are, let's actually, to be on the same page, that, to make sure that everybody's on the same page, let's actually look at what that is. In one particular example. So let's consider that chi, this unit vector, is a vector zero, zero, one. So it's a vector in the z direction. <coughs> well, if that's the case, then my matrix, my particular element that depends on that particular chi with beta is going to be e to the minus. So if I just use that, <coughs> if I use this in here, so I get what do I get? So is this the same notation that, I, oh, sorry. Yesterday we didn't have a minus, right? So somebody should have done that. 
So yesterday we didn't have a minus here, but it doesn't matter. We will soon have a minus too. But so when we put this in here, we get minus beta half sigma z. That's what we have, right? Well, we have to compute what this is. Well, this thing is nothing but the sum from n equals to zero. I'm going to expand the exponential, okay? That's a way to compute this thing. And I'm going to separate terms into terms with odd powers and terms with even power, okay? So I'm gonna write the terms first with even powers. So the terms with even powers will look like this. And the terms with odd powers will look like this. Okay, <clears throat> now all I have to use is that sigma z is one zero zero minus one, and therefore sigma z squared is the identity, and this implies is that sigma z to any odd power is sigma z, and sigma z to any even power gives me the identity. <clears throat> so that's pretty good, because then I can replace this sigma z here by the identity because it's given to a given con <clears throat> exponentiated to an even power. So you get minus beta half, two to the n, this thing times the identity plus, and in this case, we just get this, one over two n plus one factorial, minus beta over two, two n plus one, sigma z. Well, but this series is also known as hyperbolic cosine of minus beta half times the identity plus the hyperbolic sine of the same quantity. <coughs> okay, I'm sure you all have done this, but just want to make sure that we are all, that we don't think about this as mysterious objects, but as familiar objects. Now, what is this? <coughs> so our object, let, let me call it, well, uh, so the one we're computing now is cosine hyperbolic beta plus sinh of minus beta half, <coughs> we have here, what do we have? We have zero, zero, cosine, hyperbolic cosine minus hyperbolic sine. Is there any particular reason you're not putting the minus sign here? Or cosine sine zero, because you could just do that. Yeah, I could do that, yes. But, well, doesn't matter. So, so let me leave it there and, <coughs> Yeah, it doesn't matter. Now I'm gonna write this as exponentials, right? So I'm gonna write it as exponentials. So these two guys will give me, this one gives me e to the x plus e to the minus x over two. I mean, where x is minus beta half and this one gives me with a minus sign. So I just get e to the minus beta half. Zero, zero, e to the beta half, okay? Now, this still doesn't look very familiar, I guess, uh, but if we look at this thing, okay, we can now learn what happens. So if we perform this transformation on a vector, what do we get as a V prime? So V prime would be V zero prime plus V three prime, prime, something here, something here that I don't care because this transformation clearly will only affect these two guys. It will not do anything to these guys. So these guys will stay the same Okay, but this thing is gonna be what? So I have to start with this matrix, e to the minus beta half, zero, zero, e to the beta half. So I multiply this thing. These guys will remain the same, so I don't care. And then we have e to the minus beta half, zero, zero, e to the beta half. <coughs> and then what do I get? Well, this guy with this guy and this guy, give me an e to the minus beta 
B0 plus B3. These guys stay the same. And then I get E to the beta B0 minus B3. Nothing happens. Now I can read my transformations. B prime plus B0 prime plus B3 prime is E to the minus beta B0 plus B3. And B prime minus B prime 3, E to the beta B0 minus B3. Okay? So is this completely clear to everybody? Now we just solve for B0 prime and B3 prime. And what do we get? <clears throat> any eraser, which is, yeah, which is not jumping distance from the, <laughs> okay, so, so let me erase this. Is this all clear? Okay, so this implies is that V prime zero is equal to what? Well, we just add up the two things, right, and put a half. <coughs> Right, so we just add up these two equations, and therefore we get we get a half e to the minus beta plus e beta b zero, and the other one we get plus a half e to the minus beta e beta b three, and the same thing for b three. We get it, and then you see immediately that this thing is hyperbolic cosine. And this thing is minus hyperbolic sine of beta, okay? And this should be, now, now you should say, oh yes, this is the thing that I actually learned in high school, no? <laughs> oh, okay, fine. But then, but then, this is literally what you call the rapidity. Okay, so we're fine. But now there is something really nice about this thing, which is that if anyone has tried to construct the generators of the Lorentz group and work out the commutation relations of the generators, we'd probably realize that the Lorentz group looks very complicated, okay? in the standard way that everybody does it. But since we are smarter, of course we are smarter, we're gonna use this SL2C version and look at the commutation relation. Well, the commutation relations, we have six generators. Well, what are the commutation relations? Take Ji with Jj. <coughs> what do we get? Yeah, so we get an i. Well, this i is actually the complex number i. It has nothing to do with this i. Get i, j, k, j, k. That's great. Now, what happens if we, if we get, if we take two m's, we actually get minus i, epsilon i, j, k, I get what? That's why I get a J and I don't get a, a, another M. <coughs> and last but not least, J I M J, we get <coughs> okay. Well, this looks pretty easy compared to the usual representations uh, that you would see. What does this, what does this have? Does this have a mass? Because it's kind of Yeah. So this thing tells us already, so we know that these j's are the genera generators of, I mean, this is very familiar. This part, you should all know very, very well. These are the generators of SU2 or rotations in three dimensions. And this is precisely the commutation relation that any operator should have with J if the operator transforms as what? As a vector under rotations, okay? So this means 
that m is an SO3 vector, which we know it should be. Okay. Now there is some, this looks very good. But there is something that is even more exciting than that. It's something very, very interesting. What happens to the algebra if I do the following? Suppose that I send j to j, but I send m to minus m. What happens to the algebra? Yeah, the algebra doesn't change, right? Because the minus sign will drop from here. The minus sign will drop from here. So it seems that I could have started the whole discussion and to get a representation of SL2C, I could have used another set of objects that I can call bar. Well, that would be a little bit, well, I'm gonna put the I. So this is a bar, okay? So this is not a vector sign, this is just a, okay? In other words, this guy would be minus I sigma K over two, and this guy would be sigma K, sigma, sorry, sigma I over two, okay? That's why I told you that there was gonna be a minus sign, yes? But, but you said that we could have expected that M would have been an SO3 vector? Or yes. Well, because this is a generator of boost, right. right? So you do a boost in a particular direction in a space. <laughs> yes. Okay. <coughs> so that means that we could have started with these guys and also get another representation of SL2C. It's also a two-dimensional representation because these are also two by two matrices. Okay. Are they in equivalent representations. So what does it mean that two representations are equivalent? Well, they are equivalent if you can make a change of basis of your vector space, and then the two representations are connected by a simple change of basis. In this case, they are not connected by a simple change of basis, okay? So that's an exercise for you to show that they are not. <clears throat> Very soon you will show that two things are connected by a simple change of basis, but yes. How the, the use of color representation is relevant, right? We, we want that everything is independent of the representation, but I mean. What do you mean? No, of course not. You need a, what happens? What do you mean that things are independent of the representation okay, that you use? Well, in another representation. Yeah, the photon is in the vector representation, right? Right, okay. Our complex scalars are in the scalar representation of the Lorentz group. Of course, the scalar representation is a trivial representation in the sense that it's not faithful. It doesn't really tell you what the group was, right? It's mapping the whole group into the identity. So the identity doesn't tell you where it came from. So it's not a faithful representation, but it's a representation. So of course things matter, right? In fact, so now we're going to precisely answer somebody's question. Well, question. Can you just begin the definition of an equivalent representation? Yeah, so two representations are equivalent, let me say when they are equivalent. They are equivalent if they can be connected by a simple change of basis of your vector space. Okay, now we're gonna see that in explicitly. <clears throat> okay, so let me introduce, now is the time to introduce the vector space on which these guys actually act, okay? That was somebody's question. So our two by two matrices act on, of course, a two dimensional vector space. But a complex one. Okay, so if you have an object that transforms <coughs> like these guys under this representation, okay? So I'm going to introduce notation for the indices. 
So this is going to be a vector, a two-dimensional object, in a, a vector in C2, or, or an element in C2, that transforms like this. Of course, alpha and beta carry two labels. I mean, they can take two values. This psi is a vector in this vector space. So psi has two components. It's just an element of C2. And this is a two by two matrix. So two by, what do two by two matrices do? Well, they act on a two dimensional object, okay? Now, we discovered another representation. So we have another representation. So we should give a name to the vector space on which this guy acts and distinguish this one from this one. So for reasons we're going to discuss, hopefully today, I'm going to call this R, and I'm going to call the vectors on which this guy acts as L. And people also like to change the indices just to keep track of things, okay? So they put a dot on them. Yeah, it looks uh, complicated. But it's actually convenient because then you can immediately keep track of the transformation properties of objects just by looking at the indices. So that's very nice. It looks at like, a, like an inconvenience now, but you will soon see that it's actually nice. Okay? Yes? Yes. No, each representation, these are two different vector spaces. They both are isomorphic to C2. Okay? The first time we encountered the third, we will find equivalent representation, so we have to work with both representations. You mean of the same dimension? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I think it's probably the first time. Yes, so, I mean, I can find any other representation that, we, that is equivalent to either of these two. Yes, two-dimensional representations, they are all equivalent to one of these two. So, in this case, we have to choose between one of the representations or work with both? According to our friend's principle here, we will probably have to study both and see what happens. Yeah, right, so, so you said last time that we should explore everything that can be possibly explored. So, so we should study both. So the R and the, and the L stand for right and left, okay? Actually, Handed. <laughs> yes. And it has to do, as we will see, with the helicity. Okay? Very good. So now, we also go back to somebody else's question. And the question was, what happens to our vector here? Well, just at the risk of making you upset, I'm going to introduce even another label for the indices. Because as you see, this index, the first index of B, transforms under the first representation, under the right-handed representation, right? Under the A representation. But the next index seems to transform under a very strange representation, okay? So I'm actually gonna try to make that explicit by saying that the first index transforms like this, and this one we don't know. So what do I mean by we don't know? Well, we have the matrix A, and the matrix A has indices A, B, and it acts on this, we're summing over beta, and now we're gonna have some index gamma, and we have this A dagger object with indices gamma hat, beta hat, okay? You see, these are just 
names for the indices. I mean, they take values from one to two and we are summing over them, okay? And these are just labels of the four components of a two by two matrix, okay? There is nothing really deep here. I'm just trying to keep track of the representations, okay? Now, what is this? Well, this is also just a conjugate of an element of A, but which one? Well, it's the beta hat gamma hat, right? Because we have to transpose. So if we now put this to the other side, just a trivial thing, if we fix gamma hat, okay, fix this value, pretend that we're only considering a particular value, this is a vector that has two components. I mean, it's a two-component object. Here, by vector, I'm talking about the vector space we're talking about, right? So it's not the vector that we're used to, but it's, it's this vector space. So this is a two-component object that transforms in the right-handed representation, right? It's exactly doing that, right? Now, the same thing, if I hide this index, there is a gamma hat here. So this object is now transforming under a very strange representation. Could this be a new representation? A new two-dimensional representation? I already told you the answer, so I somehow spoiled the, <laughs> the, the question. And the worst part is I did it myself. So, <laughs> so, but I'll ask the question nevertheless. Is A star a new representation? Then the answer is no. But why is not a new representation? Well, because there exists, and this is something that some of you should try, there exists a change of basis. But a change of basis in this vector space is made by unitary matrices, unitary transformations, okay? So there exists a Q that is unitary such that Q on A star, Q dagger. So this is a way a change of basis will transform your two by two matrix, right? So in the new basis, it will be, guess what? A bar. That's that, okay? So your exercise is to show, not only to show that, well, okay, once again, I'll spoil the thing. Because the fun thing would be to find it, right? But I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you what it is. So it doesn't, the exercise is no longer to show that there exists one, but to check that this is one. <laughs> okay. Very good. <laughs> All right. So what does that mean? What do we do with that? Yes. That's right. Yes. But not, yeah, I, I I really don't want people to, to, to get confused with the terminology of vector, okay? Let's actually get rid of vector from now on. Now I, under, I, now I understand why people decided to not, not to call these guys vectors, because it's very confusing, right? Even though this is a vector space, we don't want to call the elements vectors. How are we going to call them? Spinners. So this object, one of the indices transforms as a spinner in the right-handed representation, and the other index transforms in a representation which is equivalent to the left-handed representation. So how would you call this guy? How can we call this representation? Well, a nice way to call it would be a bispinner representation. So the vector representation of the Lorentz group in terms of SL2C 
is equivalent to the by spinor representation. By because we have the two indices. I mean, you sometimes you will hear this terminology, and this is the vector representation of SO3,1. Okay, very good. So, remember, we are in the business of trying to construct every possible theory there is in the world, or there could ever be. So we're always in the lookout for Lagrangians that we can make out of anything we see and we have at hand, okay? One of the properties of the Lagrangian is that it must be Lorentz invariant, right? So how can we make a Lorentz invariant out of these guys? Well, one way to make a Lorentz invariant or a scalar with respect to the Lorentz group would be to produce something that is SL to C invariant, right? But in QFT zero, we made, we built SL to C invariants. Do you remember what they were? Imagine that we took, yeah, exactly. So imagine that we take one of these right-handed guys with index alpha, and we take another one with index beta, right? If we take the determinant of this, of a matrix made out of these guys, then we get something that is SL2C invariant, right? Because the determinant will not change as you apply an SL2C transformation. Well, but the determinant is nothing but summing with the anti-symmetric matrix, right? So this is a scalar. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now, If we take psi r and we conjugate this object, okay, under which representation does this guy transform? Well, this guy transforms with the A star of, with the A star representation. But that representation is equivalent to this representation. But it's not exactly the same representation. I mean, we have to make a change of basis to go from one to the other. So, if we start with this guy, right? Say it has an index, let's call it beta hat, right? Because it transforms under the A star representation. If we want to make really something that transforms under the A bar representation, which we are declaring are the only two fundamental ones that we're gonna keep always, then we have to make the change of basis. Okay, but the change of basis, I mean, if you remember what sigma two is, this is basically the epsilon, <laughs> the epsilon, the anti-symmetric matrix. So we'll take this guy and multiply by, now I'm gonna say that this guy is a guy that transforms this thing into the dot representation, right? This guy now transforms under the A bar representation, right? So this is pretty, very nice. Now, I can take, so this is somebody that belongs, that is some psi left alpha dot, okay? Now, what if I, to make a Lorentz scalar, I can put a psi left beta dot and contract with alpha dot beta dot. Right? Isn't this a scalar? According to this. But now done for the left guys. I mean, of course, I could have done this for the left guys too. I didn't do it, but we could have done it. Okay? So that's how, that's what we just did here. So what is this thing? Well, you see, this index is sum with this index, and that gives us a Kronecker delta. So this is nothing but taking the conjugate of this guy and treating it as a row vector, but that has a name. And dotting it with this guy. So that is a Lorentz scalar. Now, can we make a Lagrangian out of this thing? 
yes, we could start using this thing to make a Lagrangian, but the Lagrangian should also be Hermitian, right? So that's right. So we need, we will have to combine this with this guy to make something Hermitian. So this thing actually starts to have to be Lagrangian material. Okay, but if we just use this as a Lagrangian, it would be too boring because there are no derivatives. There is no evolution, no change, okay? So we just stop there and leave it there, okay? Hoping that maybe at some point we will use it. Yes? Well, well, the first thing, the first thing is that you may ask, why didn't I use this to construct the pieces of the Lagrangian? And the reason is that I want to consider only one field now. Okay, I, of course, if these guys are the same, we will get zero. Tomorrow we will realize that in the in the actual theory, uh, this might actually provide something interesting, but we will not discuss it today. But if we only consider one kind of right-handed spinner and one kind of left-handed spinner, then this is all what we can write. Okay. Okay. So we need to introduce some dynamics into our system. So we need dynamics. Okay. We know that in Lagrangians, the dynamics is provided by introducing this operator, right? So this operator If we were able to dot this operator with a vector, we could produce a Lorentz scalar. Okay? That's the first hint of what we have to do next. If we find any vector made out of our spinners, then we could dot that vector with our operator and produce a scalar. And that would give us a chance to have a Lagrangian that has dynamics. Okay? Now, How can we produce a vector? Okay, so we need a Lorentz vector. <clears throat> okay, let's try first with just one kind of spinners. Okay, can we make a Lorentz vector with just one kind of spinners? with the right-handed ones. Well, one observation we can make is that if we take psi dagger times psi, okay, and we apply a rotation, just look at, remember what the rotations were, right? Um, well, look in your notes what rotations were because they are not here anymore. No. Nope. That's right. So rotations were unitary operators, right? Well, if you apply a unitary transformation on psi, what happens to this combination? It's invariant. So this thing is a scalar under SO3. Okay? So here we're really using the fact that we have, every time we say words, scalars, vectors, spinners, we have to say with respect to what, okay? So this guy is a scalar under SO3, okay? How about this thing? What do you think this guy transforms like under SO3? No, that's this guy. That's a hint. It's a vector. Well, it's very, very tempting to say, look, I have this object. 
this in fact looks like the identity. I mean, we can put the identity here. So this together with this, we have seen before and seems to be the right combination to be a vector, right? But we are not sure. So we have to perhaps allow, let's try to make a four vector. So this will be the zeroth component of our vector. So let's call it uh, V0. Now these guys have to come together Let's call this V. Now, it turns out that, well, this looks natural, but maybe there is something that has to be fixed, okay? We have to check if these four things together make a vector, okay? Yes? Exactly, the one that Sad reminded us, yes. Because I'm looking at how they transform under SO3 transformations. But we want to construct a Lorentz vector, right? That's the target. But I'm telling you that out of the objects we have, there is a hint that maybe out of this guy we can make a Lorentz vector. Okay? Now, could this be a Lorentz vector? Likewise. So we were initially considering SO3, comma one, and this is SO3. I'm using this as a hint. This is a subgroup, right? A subgroup of the Lorentz group is a group of rotations. And we know that a vector of the Lorentz group should have the following property. The zeroth component must be a scalar under rotations, under boring rotations. Okay. And the three components the last three components must be an actual vector under those rotations. Okay. So this guy, okay. these four objects, they really want to do the job, right? Okay. But, well, so far, there might be something here. Oh, <laughs> what I'm saying is that we don't know if they actually do it. So I'm allowing a number. I'm allowing some something. I mean, this guy times WR yeah, yeah. times some proportionality constant is also a vector. So we should allow something like this and then check. In fact, you're going to check it. So your exercise is to show that, I just want to get this right. It's a 50% chance of getting it wrong. Exercise show that both are vectors, Lorentz vectors, if WR is plus 1 and W left is minus 1. So happens. Well, it's not very surprising, right? Well, how can you check this? So let me give you a hint. Consider again boosts in the z direction. Okay? Just do boosts in the in the z direction. Okay? By doing that, you see that the two representations are different precisely in the boost. Right? There was a minus sign just in the boost. So it's natural to expect that there will have to be some change due to precisely asking the thing to be a four vector, which will require you to check the boost. Okay? Direction. This is a hint. Okay. So now it seems that we're in business. Well, that is, if we learn how to combine this with the derivative to make a Lorentz scalar, okay? <laughs> when, 
there is no combination of tire and tire. Sorry? Well, there uh, can be any combination of tire and tire. I mean, by constructing a vector like this, but uh, instead of having two hours, one hour, and one hour. Well, try. And if you find one, tell me. In fact, you know, that the drawing is that you construct it there. There is a combination. But it's a scalar. Yeah. He, he wants to build a vector. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. That's why if you find one, tell me. <laughs> No, well, who knows? I mean, they shouldn't assume anything. Okay, so motivated by the sign that we found there, right? It's natural to define the following. Let's define sigma mu. Well, this one is the familiar one, right? But now with the index up, so we have a minus sign here. But in order to distinguish it from this other one, this one will be the weird one, which looks like the four vector that we are used to with the index down, but now with the index up, meaning that there is a plus sign here. Okay, so, but this is just a definition. In fact, as I said, this is the standard one, and this is a new object, this sigma tilde. Now, with these guys, we can write down very nicely our new vectors. They are side dagger R, sigma tilde, mu, psi R, and psi left, sigma mu, psi left. Okay? Very good. So we now have our vectors. So how can we make a scalar out of these guys? Well, we can just take this and apply the differential operator to it. Okay? Do you not have just changed the one and minus one being twisted till the... Sorry? You could have just had twist the one and minus one, omega r with omega l. No, your, your, your job is to show that those are the only choices. I mean, if you had switched that definition, then you could have switched the tilde. No? Yeah, I mean, this, defi the, this is a definition that we always have, that, okay. that we always have, right? Okay. I mean, this I'm introducing because very soon the index mu will disappear. So it's convenient to have, very soon it's, it's convenient to have, yeah, trust me, it's convenient to have this tilde in there. Okay, but it's just a definition, there is nothing deep to it. Now, to construct a scalar, or in other words, to construct things that are good for building Lagrangians, what can we do? Well, the first thing, the natural thing to do would be to apply d mu to a one of, the, of our vectors. Well, that would be a scalar, sure enough, but what's going to happen? But it's a total derivative, so it's not going to be good. Well, but this guy, if this guy is a scalar, well, so is when this guy acts on one of these guys. So we can choose one of the two possibilities and declare that that's our scalars that we can use to build Lagrangians. So we can have this, the derivative now acting on the right-handed part, on this part, or, or and, it depends on, it depends on what we want to do. Okay, so we have our building blocks, except that these objects, now the other property that Lagrangians must have is that they must be Hermitian, right? So we not only need a Lorentz scalar, so here again, this is Lorentz, we also need something that is Hermitian. And that means that we will have to put a plus minus i here, okay? Well, in fact, any number here would do any purely imaginary number will do. So in fact, why don't we do it? Let's put, let's, sorry, from there. Let's do something like AI. And here we can put a BI if you want. Presumably if you just contracted the indices for these, the, those vectors, would you also not get it? 
excellent. We could build a scalar, right? But that guy now would be something that makes left and right interact with a quartic interaction. So now you should go ahead and compute the dimensionality of the coupling and see what happens to that. Okay, so now we're in the business of building a Lagrangian that describes free particles. That's step zero, right? So we start by building Lagrangians that describe free particles, and then we make our lives more interesting or harder, depends on your point of view, and introduce interactions. So putting these two guys together, sure enough, will give you something that could be in a Lagrangian. So it's also Lagrangian material, yes. Two things, the first one, what do you mean the i over if i is commutative version? There's no minus sign that appears as soon as you put the sign that the i is over. Then you have to integrate by parts, right? Uh, and then you get a minus sign. OK, so what do we want to do? Now, let me start with a single one. Let's start with a single one of them. Let's discuss that after the lecture, OK? So let's start with a single one and see if we can build that. What kind of theory we get? Uh, huh. New one. Very appropriate. OK? So let's construct our first Lagrange. So our first Lagrangian will be a Lagrangian for only the right guys, OK? So we start with this. We have our sigma tilde, mu, then mu, psi r. Now we can do, we say, well, this looks completely fine. It's a scalar. It's quadratic in the fields. So why do we need this thing to be quadratic in the fields and not linear? Because to have interesting equations of motion. If it's more than quadratic, like Sad wanted to get, to, to get, then the equations of motion will be more than linear. And then our life will be more complicated. OK? So this looks like a completely fine Lagrangian. So we can consider the field equations. OK? So let's say that we compute the field equations with respect to this guy. There is no term that has derivative with respect to this, right? So we just have, we can just do the derivative with respect to this field and immediately get that our equation is this equation. Okay? But you would say, wait, what if you do it varying? So this was varying psi dagger. What if you do it varying psi? Well, if you do it varying psi, the only contribution you will get is now the second contribution in the Euler-Lagrange equations. And this will give you something that is equivalent to this. <coughs> so you will get from here, you will only get this piece. But there is this derivative. And that would act on this side dagger. This would be equal to zero. Now, these two equations are exactly equivalent, OK? Because you can take the dagger of the whole thing and get this equation. So there is only one equation we have to solve. This is very similar to the case of the complex scalar. Yes? I guess then the quantizer that we get from the momentum Kind of 
Well, it doesn't occur in the Lagrangian if you write it, if you write it like this. If you integrate by parts, it appears here. So what do you think is happening? What do you think is happening? And okay, let's not worry about quantization now. And the other, so we're trying to construct um, behavior and terms. So why can't we just contact um, sigma with itself? Sigma is a is a matrix that is made out of numbers. So I, I meant like uh, psi r sigma psi r with. Uh, because, uh, there will be four fields now, right? Okay. Remember, we're looking for something. For yeah, okay. So, so maybe I should write it so that, okay. so that we, 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 settle, we settle this. We're looking for something that is a free Lagrangian, free theory. This implies is that we need something that is quadratic in the fields. Oh, sure. which implies is that it's linear. Sorry, that the equations of motion will be linear. That's what I want to write, field equations. Okay, so now let's look at this equation. Yes. Which one? No, it's not a scalar. We just we just use that as the first component. In fact, perform perform the boost in the z direction, right? So what you're doing is multiplying this guy by our by our matrix e beta half zero zero e minus beta half. This guy will pick up that guy on the left. Together, you will get the square of this matrix. So this will definitely not be invariant under boost. But that's what we want. We don't want this guy to be invariant. We want this guy to transform as the zeroth component of a, of a vector, and it will. Okay? Very good. So let's now solve these field equations. Um, so what do we do whenever we have differential equations of this form? What we do is that we plug in some plane wave. We go to momentum space. So far, we have been doing it with the whole, we're writing the whole field in momentum space, but it takes too long to write the whole integral d4, d, d3k and so on. So let's consider a single plane wave. So what do I mean by that? We're going to write our psi alpha that depends on t and x, we're going to assume that it's a single plane wave, or that would be our ansatz. Okay, so this would be depend. This would depend on k e to the i. So let me see the notation minus as usual dot x. So that would be a single plane wave. Okay. I mean, probably we have taken less time to actually do it, but it doesn't matter. Yes, thank you. So we need an index alpha. Okay, so it's time dependency with psi r, k. The k is the zero vector? This so is a four vector, vector now. Yeah, okay, it's a four vector. It's a four vector, right? Okay, very good. So we are taking this as our ansatz for a plane wave, okay? So there is a k zero. This thing depends on, on the whole k. We still don't know what this k has to be. Okay, we have to plug it into the equation and see what happens. So let's do it. So what is the equation? Well, we take sigma and we take the derivative. Of course, this guy acts on this thing here. So let's put an index. Uh, so what do we want to do? Ah, let's forget about the index for the moment. So we have this. Okay, now the derivative will bring down a minus i k 
mu e to the minus i k dot x. But this will have to be zero, okay? So we get the following equation. We get that k mu sigma tilde mu, this is a two by two matrix, right? Acting on our little two vector or a two component object has to be zero. But now we can use what our sigma tilde is. Do we have it on the board? Yeah, it's that one over there. So this guy has a plus, but this is a contraction using the Minkowski metric, right? So this thing would actually look like we will get um, k0 times the identity minus k dot sigma acting on our little wave function has to be zero. Okay, any ideas how to solve this? Well, I'll give you a hint. Move the identity to the other side. So you have k dot sigma. That's right. We're going to have an eigenvector problem is equal to k0. So we are looking for objects that have, that are eigenvectors of this matrix with eigenvalue k0. Okay, well, but this, this is a two by two problem, right? These are matrices are two by two. So how difficult can this be? Shouldn't be that difficult. So what do we do to find the, the eigenvalues of a matrix that is two by two? Well, the simplest thing is to compute the determinant and the trace, right? So what is the determinant of this matrix? Right? Well, there is, <laughs> this is what it has to be because if this guy was a full four vector, we would get the norm of the four vector. And if you set the zero component to zero, then the identity will not contribute. So we should get the minus sign coming from the four dimensional norm, okay? How about the trace? Exactly. So that means that the two eigenvalues Okay, of this thing, must add up to zero. And they have to multiply and give you this. Well, where are the possibilities then? So the eigenvalues can only be plus minus k squared. So let me give a name to this. Thank you. Okay. And only, so let me call this WK. So what do we learn? We learn that this guy, in order to have a solution, K0 has to be equal to plus minus WK. When, when do we see that happening? Which, what kind of vectors satisfy this property? Null vectors, yes. In other words, k0 square minus k square has to be zero. So we are learning that our theory is a theory of massless particles. So 
what kind of particles they are, well, that's what we have to find out. But one thing for sure is that they are massless. Where do we where, where do we have an M? The, the Lagrange, the, the Lagrange has no mass, no mass. Yeah, I mean, there's no quite Well, there is a little trick that one can do and goes beyond this course, but you will see it in beyond the standard model or no in the standard model probably. <laughs> or beyond. <laughs> You can build something that are called Majorana spinners, and then, then there is a trick to do that. But with what we are doing, no, we cannot add a mass term to this theory. Just like that, with only right-handed bile spinners. Yes? Since we didn't have a mass term, it shouldn't be surprising. Really no, of course it is surprising, because we have never seen a Lagrangian like this. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy, it's, it's, a, it's a strange object, right? Where is the Lagrangian? Where did it go? Behind this one, thanks. I mean, if I, if I had given you this Lagrangian from the beginning, right? This is a Lagrangian made out of objects that are two-dimensional, right? Don't be, don't, don't, don't be fooled by the simplicity of what it looks like. Try to write it down in components. It's a big, big object, okay? So you would say, well, I mean, I don't know what it looks like. I mean, what it describes, okay? Okay, fine. If you say if you say that you're not surprised, that's okay. <laughs> I'm getting a little bit lost as to where are we going because the idea is to yeah. So it seems we the next century. We know there are yeah. So it seems we are wasting time. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got photons. Out, right? Which photons? They don't look like photons. No, photons. Photons. Okay. That's a very good question. That's a very good question. In fact, that's a very, very good question. Let's look at this, let, let's look at this guy, right? So you say, well, as an operator, k looks like the momentum operator. I mean, this would be the eigenvalue of the momentum operator. This thing, if we divide by two, becomes which operator? The yeah. angular momentum operator, right? So we're learning that this thing, but we have to we have to divide by two, right? Okay. So this number here is the helicity of the particle. Okay. So you're right. We are finding massless particles. But this massless particle, this particular one, has helicity a half. And the photon has helicity is what? Plus minus one. So it seems we are missing a partner of this guy, right? How can we build something that has helicity minus a half? Then? What do you think? Exactly. Now use the left-handed. Now you know the right-handed and left-handed idea, right? Now helicity is a good quantum number, meaning that it's an invariant of the object only when you have massless particles, right? Because the component of the spin in the direction of motion can change for massive particles depending on the frame, yeah. right? But for massless particles, this is a good quantum number. That's why we have been talking about helicity for photons. And this guy is also, well, of course, that is if k0, I mean, if we are inside the light cone, right? Because inside the Lycon, k0, the sign of k0 is a Lorentz invariant, right? So we have to be inside the Lycon for this number, the sign of this guy to be Lorentz invariant. Okay. So it seems that we succeeded in getting the wrong theory. So we got, we got, we got a theory of massless spin or spin a half or massless helicity, well, objects with helicity a half. We could also get a theory, okay? So remember, we said that multiplying this by any number doesn't change anything in the story. 
So we could also try to make our theory more interesting by adding particles with helicity minus a half. And those would be these guys. OK? Yes. Need a derivative. No, but now we're allowing the right-hander guys and the left-hander guys to be in the same Lagrangian, OK? So is there any other interaction that will allow us to mix them? Oh, no. That was a disaster. Yes, it was here. Our very early Lagrangian material we found, right, that precisely mixes both of them is quadratic in the fields, so it will not introduce any crazy interactions. The theory still has a chance of being free. So why not add it here? OK. Well, but this Lagrangian looks like uh, it has lots of possibilities. We have A, B, and C here. But of course, if you have a field and you rescale the field, I mean, nobody told us what the overall scaling of the field is. So we can change it if we want. It's just a field redefinition. So we can absorb this constant A by rescaling these two guys, OK, by a square root of A. And we can absorb this B by rescaling these two guys by a square root of B. Now, this, these guys were real. So this guy will pick up the same scaling, and this guy will pick up the same scaling. So those scalings can all be reabsorbed into the definition of C. So we only have one free parameter, C. So after saying all that, really all I want to do is to erase this. <laughs> No, because we really want to have something that is Hermitian from the beginning. Well, and, and this, the scaling that I'm doing factors from here only if the rescalings were real. Otherwise, we'd get a star, right? And different ones from each. So that was important. OK? So that's a possibility. And have to look at the time. Of course, we have plenty of time. So can, can you repeat the argument taking off those constants? Oh, constant that I can rescale. Uh, I can rescale my fields. Yes, but uh, the rescaling of the left hand and the right hand need not to be the same. Right? Yes, but one appears here, one appears here. True, but in the first term, you have A and B. So, okay, so, so let's, let, let's do it again. We have this. I've sent psi r to 1 over square root of a. a is real. Psi left, 1 over square root of b. And I'm defining c to be c tilde, which I'm calling c. <laughs> OK, so this is pretty interesting, right? So this Lagrangian describes two massless particles interacting. And yet, it looks like a free Lagrangian. So I mean, this is a dream Lagrangian, right? So we can solve this, and yet it's a theory of two guys interacting. Right? So this is a, it's actually great. OK, so let's solve the theory. I mean, let's compute, let's compute what the equations are. Well, one of the equations, we got it already. It looks like this, right? So we're going to assume again that they are free. Well, let's not assume anything. Let's just compute the field equations. OK, so what are we going to get? Well, we get when we vary psi dagger 
uh, actually, yeah, let's vary psi dagger. So we get i, the identity, del zero. I'm going to write this operator explicitly. You will see why. Minus, oh, this is a C. And then in this case, we are using the other, the other sigma matrices. And then we get minus sigma side left minus C side right equal to zero. So these are our equations. For some reason, I have, for some reason I was calling this D. <laughs> so the, <laughs> I probably miss a C somewhere. In any case, so these are the two equations that we get. Now they look like a couple system of equations, right? But they are still linear in the field. Well, these equations we can think about these equations as equations that are acting on a bigger object, right? We can think about psi left as being one component of an object and psi, and psi right being one component of an object and psi left as the other component of the object. Okay, so let's try to write these equations as a single equation acting on a single object. So let me define this guy to be a single object made out of side left and side right. Okay, so can you guys help me write the equations? These two equations would be a single equation for this guy. So what would it be? Well, Well, we can make, yes. <laughs> well, it would, it would help to introduce a vector of matrices, right, that will combine, well, first of all, there will be the identity, that would be boring, but there will be a vector of matrices that combine these guys with these guys, ones acting on this guy and ones acting on these guys, okay? So we must have the sigma on this side and minus sigma on this side. Now the mass terms, oh, sorry, these guys, we need a matrix. <laughs> I spoiled the whole thing. <laughs> so this thing. <laughs> you see, it was unfortunate that I couldn't use enough letters so that this would have come out to be <laughs> exactly <laughs> M. As yesterday, we got the electric charge to be E. So we need a matrix that will flip these two guys, right? So that matrix would be just this. Now, with the use of these two matrices and, of course, the identity matrix, so we now have the identity matrix, which I'm going to define as one. We can finally write our equation, a single equation for all these guys. So given that it's one, I'm not going to write it. Thank you. Sure, there was a reason. Yeah, maybe. Yes. So, one thing. So, I take this equation and I add in the second equation with the differential operator of the first one, right? I'll find a kind of order equation for both psi R and psi L. Yes. Does that mean that psi R and psi L are scalar fields? No. Okay. No. L let's see what we're going to get, okay? So let's write this guy. Now, I already told you that this C will end up being a mass. And the reason we know it will end up being a mass is that this is something familiar to you because in QFT0, in QFT0, you were supposed to read chapter one of Weinberg. And there, you saw how Dirac struggled 
to actually come out with this equation. So this equation is Dirac's equation. But written in a slightly funny way, I'll tell you why. So this m will end up being the mass, and we have to check, I mean, we can call it from now on m, but we have to check why is it actually m, why is it the mass, okay? But in order to do that, it's actually convenient to multiply by beta everywhere in this equation so that the mass term appears just multiplying this guy without this funny change that we had to induce here. So let's do it here. OK, so multiply by beta. And what did you get? You get i L0, now beta on this side, plus alpha dot this, minus m. Yes, thank you. And this is equal to zero. Okay. Okay. So this is what you found in the book, which was nice to define gamma zero at four vector, because we now have this guy here and this guy is here, and they nicely combine in the right way to form a four, a four vector, so why not define them as a four vector? And using this, we can think about our equation as equation that simply contracts these two guys. Okay. And this is a form that you will find in all the books of the Dirac equation, okay? Now, yes? So we are calling it a four vector, so this follows from what we've already done, but it's a nice volume for Exactly. Now you can take these guys and perform the transformations and see, and see that it transforms as a four vector. Because you can now apply the transformation in these spaces and see how these pieces transform, okay? And in mind, the equation needs to be Lorentz invariant, right? So the upper half size, but this is zero. So the equation has to be covariant. So what does it mean that something is covariant? Under some representation of your group. Okay? So this equation is covariant, it's not invariant. Yes? I mean, uh, in the literature, at least the gamma nu, they're not, they not co vectors because they don't really transform. Uh, and it's a final yeah, well, that's true. So find out how gamma is transformed. We'll probably discuss it tomorrow. But right now, what we want to do is to give some justification for why this is called M, and to actually write down a Lagrangian that was equivalent to the one that I just erased. <laughs> I was thinking about the first thing first. Okay, so I don't think we have much more time. So we now want to write down a Lagrangian for Psi and Psi dagger that was equivalent to the previous Lagrangian. Well, it's just an exercise, so Using, so use, use the following definition. This bar doesn't mean what we, what we were saying before. This is actually the definition of this times 
the matrix gamma zero or beta, let's call it gamma zero. Okay. And this as a name is called the Dirac adjoint. So whenever you have some four dimensional object, well, by the way, this, this object has four components, okay? But the fact that the spin that the that the Dirac spinner has four four components is only an accident. In four dimensions, it has four components. In higher dimensions, it has more components, okay, than the vector representation in that dimension. Okay? So the vector representation of the Lorentz group has four components in four dimensions. And the Dirac spinner has four components in four dimensions. So now, how many components does the Dirac spinner have in arbitrary number of dimensions? Well, that goes like two to the power of the dimension. So it grows very, very rapidly, okay? While the vector representation in higher number of dimensions only grows like the dimension, okay? So there is a nice coincidence that happens precisely in four dimensions. In any case, so the exercise is to use this, and you should do the exercise before the lecture tomorrow, and show that using this, then the Lagrangian that we wrote before can be written down as As this. Well, yeah, maybe we can end the lecture here just to say that Feynman again came out with a notation that people decided to use, and which is that every time you have any vector contracted with a gamma matrices, um, so anything. Yeah, a, no, 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 no. <laughs> let's call it B mu. Then this thing is called B slash, right? Now, really, really to finish the lecture, let me mention that, <laughs> just a comment, going, going back to what Tibra was pointing out, that if you have the sigma matrices, right, sigma mu, the matrices themselves, even though we arrange them as, a, as something that has a vector index, they also have two indices that we call alpha and beta hat, all right? So this is really the object that we have to think of if we want to ask how does this object transform under the Lorentz transformations, right? So how does this thing transform? Well, if you fix these two indices, it transforms like what? like a Lorentz vector. If you fix this index and this index, it transforms like what? Like a right-handed spinner. If you fix this guy and this guy as a left-handed spinner. So this object transforms simultaneously under those three representations. So the gamma matrices also have indices, right? They are four by four matrices. Now try to find out how they transform, okay? And really, really to finish the lecture. I mean, it's just that we cannot finish it without. Yeah, we will repeat it tomorrow, but it, it would really feel incomplete if we don't do it. It's to say that these matrices define in the way we did somewhere. The only property that we're going to use that defines the physical theory is the fact that they satisfy the following algebra. Okay, where this means 
as four by four matrices. Sorry. As four by four matrices, you take this one. This is called the com the anti commutator because it has a plus sign compared to the commutator. So this clearly is a four by four matrix, and this thing has to be equal to this number. This is a number, right? For a particular set of components, this is just a number times the identity matrix. And this is called a Clifford algebra. And since I told you that all the properties will only depend on matrices that satisfy this property, you could ask if there are any other matrices different from the ones we found here that satisfy the same property. And the answer is yes, there is an infinite number. But there is one special one, which is the one that Dirac discovered, and it's going to be useful tomorrow. So let me tell you what that is. Oops. Actually, all I wanted was the eraser, <laughs> <laughs> which I got. <laughs> So we'll end the lecture with the explicit form of the Dirac matrices, which of course you know because you read the chapter. But it doesn't hurt to actually write them down. So the Dirac basis is you choose for gamma zero and for gamma i. All right, so we're going to stop here. <laughs>